is the chapter 9 part 9 video. In this video we're going to look at um, the competition between substitution and elimination in the reaction solution. So what we're going to be looking at in this video to determine whether you get primarily elimination or substitution is specifically the attacking species. In, in the case of elimination that's of course the base and substitution that is going to be the nucleophile. We're also going to look at steric hindrance and we're going to look at reaction temperature. So the first thing we're going to look at is the base nucleophile. And as you can see in this example here, when we have a sterically hindered base or nucleophile, what we start to see is that it's going to do more um, elimination and less substitution. So remember that an SN2 reaction is going to be dependent upon steric hindrance and if you've got this base attacking in the back here, there's going to be some steric hindrance. So the bulkier that this nucleophile becomes, the less it's, it's a good nucleophile and the more it becomes just a base. So if this were methoxide, just a methyl group here, we'd see a lot of substitution happening and less elimination, but because it's so bulky, we can't see as, we don't see as much substitution and we see more elimination. So here are a couple of other examples. In this case right here, we're seeing more elimination because we have a strong base and we have a secondary substrate. When we have a weaker base, we start to see more substitution as long as it's still a good nucleophile. So acetate, remember, is a weaker base because it is resonance stabilized. Ethoxide has a localized charge and so ethoxide is a stronger base, and so we are seeing some substitution, but we're also seeing more elimination. And in the case of a good nucleophile that is not as strong a base, so it's a weaker base, we're seeing almost, yeah, basically 100% substitution. So things that are strong bulky bases are going to be um, better at giving us elimination products. Here are some more examples. Right, we already talked about T-butoxide. Um, this is another ne yeah, neopentoxide. So it technically has a CH2 here, but there's enough methyl groups here to make it bulky. LDA, um, we have a negative charge and a nitrogen, and we have two isopropyl groups on here. This is also very bulky. And you can just look at the structures of the bases, and if they look particularly bulky, they're probably going to be more basic and less nucleophilic. So the kind of the take home message here is that strong bulky bases are gonna favor E2 over E uh, or over substitution reactions. So we're gonna get probably elimination versus SN2. And we also have to consider the steric hindrance of the substrate. So if you're looking over here at this primary alkyl halide, you can see that it's going to do primarily substitution if we use methoxide, some elimination, but this is gonna be a minor product. And as we make the substrate bulkier, right, so in this case a tertiary alkyl bromide, now we're gonna see SN1, right? And we'll also start to see some E2 if we have a strong base. So this is the situation where we have a base and you'll see E2 and a, and a tertiary substrate, tertiary alkyl bromide. A tertiary al alkyl bromide and the weak base is gonna give us some SN1 you're seeing a little bit of E1 over here because we have a weak base and a polar protic solvent. So in this case, the leaving group is going to fall off. We're gonna get a carbocation intermediate. We're gonna get primarily substitution, but you're also gonna see some elimination E1. If you have a strong base and a tertiary alkyl bromide, you're gonna see almost exclusively elimination via the E2 mechanism. Okay, so finally we're going to look at temperature. And temperature is going to, an increase in temperature is going to favor elimination products. So this is a reaction with a strong base, okay, hydroxide here, and we're heating it at 45 degrees. And you can see that we have um, pretty close to a 50-50 mixture of substitution versus elimination. As we heat up the reaction to 100 degrees, same conditions otherwise, now we're getting more of the elimination product. So if you really want to encourage elimination and you know that substitution is going to be competing in reaction in the reaction, 
just add some heat. That'll help to encourage the elimination product to form. Um, it, oddly, you know, you do notice that this has a polar um, product solvent. I'm not sure why they selected to use this in this particular reaction, but sometimes you are going to use polar product sol solvents for uh, E2 and SN2 reactions. So that, that's just kind of a case here where it happened. Again, not entirely sure why they made that selection. Maybe it was a solubility issue. Okay. So let's see, what is our strategy for determining if you have SN1, SN2, E1, or E2? So first of all, for all of these, you're gonna to have to have a good leave group or none of these reactions are going to occur. Look at the substitution. So if it is primary and not benzylic or allylic, it is going to be E2 or SN2. Tertiary substrates can do either elimination or SN1. Anything that's secondary, we're going to have to look at all of these different um, types of all, all of the other factors. Solvent type, polar A product solvents are typically going to favor SN2 and E2. Polar product are going to favor SN1 and E1. And remember that what we're doing here is we're kind of checking boxes. So in some cases, you might use a polar product solvent for an SN2 or E2. But if all of everything else says SN2 or E2, then that's probably what's happening. So for example, nucleophile and base strength, good nucleophiles um, that are weaker bases are gonna favor SN2. Good nucleophiles that are stronger bases could potentially do SN2 or E2. If it's a poor nucleophile but a strong base, and then we're talking about a situation where it's too bulky to be a good nucleophile and it's still very basic, you're gonna get an E2. A poor nucleophile and a weak base are gonna give you either SN1 or E1. Looking at the concentration of the nucleophile or base, higher concentrations are gonna favor SN2 and E2. Lower concentrations or dilute reactions are gonna favor SN1 and E1. The last thing to look at now is temperature because higher temperatures are gonna favor elimination reactions. So you kind of wanna walk through all of these things. Um, you know, Substitution helps to narrow things down and then look at solvent, nucleophile base, and then the concentration and the reaction temperature and kind of check make check mark all of these boxes and see which one has the most check marks and that's probably what's happening. I also have this a table for you to look at. So you can use either um, this previous slide or this table, whatever you prefer to help to sort out which reaction is which. But what we have here is the methyl situation. Methyl substrates, regardless of what you're using, um, can only do an SN2 mechanism. So a weak, a weak base, poor nucleophile, right? A poor nucleophile is just not going to be reactive in this situation because that would go through an SN1 mechanism and a methyl cation is not going to be stable at all. So you have to do SN2 here regardless of what's happening. Same thing with primary. You, If you have a poor nucleophile, that implies SN1 conditions and that really can't happen with a primary substrate. So you're going to have SN2. In the situation where you've gotten to um, a primary substrate and you have something that's a strong base but a poor nucleophile because it's too bulky, then you might start to see some E2. And of course, in this situation, um, a little bit of heat would give you more E2 versus if you kind of run the reaction a little bit colder, you might see a little bit more of the SN2 product. Secondary substrates are going to be a little bit messy because if you have the poor nucleophile weak base situation, you could potentially have SN1 or E1. Again, the way you decide between those two would be looking at um, probably the heat situation. If you're in this middle situation where you have a kind of a, something that's a weak base but a good nucleophile, you typically are probably gonna have um, some SN2 unless there are other factors that imply SN1, E1. Remember that SN1 and E1 you'd probably have a polar product solvent. You'd also have probably have very dilute reaction conditions. So you kind of have to look and see, okay, in this situation, what's going to be favored? Something that's a strong base and a good nucleophile can give you either SN2 or E2. Again, to decide between the two, look at the um, heat situation. And then if you have a strong base and a poor nucleophile with a secondary substrate, you will get E2 only. Tertiary substrates um, it, with weaker bases right? Weaker bases, poorer nucleophiles, you can get SN1 or E1, depending on the temperature. 
And again, if you have something that's a decent nucleophile but not a very good base, you might see SN1 or E1 depending on the temperature. In the situation where you have a strong base that is also, uh, either way, I guess it's a good nucleophile or a poor nucleophile. And so anytime you have a strong base in a tertiary substrate, you'll end up with E2 primarily. Okay, so that's our a summary slide. Let's do a couple of practice questions to see how well you can determine what the mechanism of the reaction is. So go ahead and give this clicker question a try. Make sure that you're paying attention to the stereochemistry of the reaction as well as the reaction conditions. So first identify the mechanism, and then once you've gotten that far, then you can figure out what, what how the stereochemistry is gonna be affected. So go ahead and pause the video and give this one a try. Okay, hopefully you identify that this was an E2 reaction mechanism. We have a strong base, Okay, we also have a polar aprotic solvent, and we have heat. So if you go back and look at your chart here, uh, we have a, a secondary alkyl bromide. So looking here, secondary alkyl bromide, strong base, good nucleophile, and heat, that's how we're going to get to E2. So that kind of, we have, you have to debate between SN2 and E2, the heat tells us E2. Okay, so then why... Um, are we getting the alkene that we're getting? Remember that we want to form the more substituted alkene. It's going to narrow things down to B or C. And then in order to determine between B and C, you need to look at the Newman projection. Okay, remember those obnoxious things? So let's look at the Newman projection really fast. So if we're going to look down, I'm going to look down this angle here. I'll have an ethyl group up, a methyl group on the right, and there will be a hydrogen on the left. Okay, on the right I'll have my bromine. Left will be hydrogen. And then I will have a carbon chain down here. So you can see that the bromine and the hydrogen are anti to each other. And that in that situation, we're going to have the methyl group on the same side as this three carbon chain, which is what you have in B. So B is going to be the correct answer. Okay, moving on, let's give this next question a try. So go ahead and pause the video and see how well you do with this one. Okay, hopefully you figured out, and in this case, the answer is E, oops. So in this case, the answer is E, Notice that we're using a poor nucleophile and also polar protic solvent. So this is going to tell you that we've got an SN1 or an E1. The heat is going to imply E1 versus SN1. And then you can see here that we're going to get the more substituted alkene, which is why E is favored over D. Okay, here's another clicker question to try. Go ahead and pause the video and give this one a try. Okay, hopefully you correctly identified the product as C. Okay, this is a um, nu good nucleophile. Right? It's not as strong a base. And also we're running the reaction at room temperature. So we're using a good nucleophile, polar aprotic solvent, which is going to say probably SN2, and room temperature is definitely going to give us the difference between an SN2 and an E2 reaction. Um, remember that an OTS, this is a TS stands for a tossel group. So a tossel group is going to be resonant stabilized. So it's going to be one of these things with the sulfur. Uh, and then we have the TS. So this is a, I've got a benzene ring here. So this group, this is what you have for the OTS group. So it's a good leaving group because once it falls off, it's a weak base, right? This negative charge is going to be resonant stabilized. And remember that in an SN2 reaction, we're going to get attack from the um, opposite side of the leaving group. So that is why the cyanide group is sticking out at you.